We welcome you to Woodland Lakes Community Church, and we are glad you are here. Before I uh, before I bring the message uh, today, I want to just say uh, to those of you that are part of the Woodland Lakes family that are not able to be in public worship and uh, you're watching this from home or watching it from some other venue, uh, but because of uh, health concerns or underlying health issues, you're not able to, to join us. I just want you to know that we miss you and uh, you are not forgotten. I want to know that uh, that I'm praying for you and, and uh, care very much for you and I would love to connect in any way you would uh, you would prefer by text or email or phone but just want you to know that, that you're missed an important part of us and if you're watching this and you're from um, maybe uh, some other church or you're not from a church at all and you're just a guest uh, we just want to say thanks for for checking this out and watching and uh, if, uh, if you're someone that's from out of state, we want to say thanks for joining us. And I hope uh, to all who are watching this, I hope this is helpful. That's my desire. That's my prayers that this would be helpful to you. And so today I want to talk to you about how love looks for the best. And we're continuing in our series on the love chapter. And our series is called What Love Looks Like. And I think Paul just unpacks in 1 Corinthians 13 what love looks like. And he gives a lot of direction on about this and I, I guess I would ask you do you mind if I talk for a while before I say anything <laughs> kind of already been doing that I guess uh, I, I've just been thinking we live in such a cynical skeptical world there's a lot of anger and anxiety and fear and I think this world is one that tends to look for the worst in people or situations and it just seems like it's getting more and more that way but I want us to be the opposite I want us to be a light. I want us at Woodland Lakes Community Church, I want us to look for the best in people. And so many times you get what you're looking for, that you'll find what you're looking for. If you really want to find something, you will find what you're looking for. So let's look for the best. Let's look for the best and not the worst. I'd like to read to you from 1 Corinthians 13. This is where we've been living for the last uh, 10 weeks. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, starting at verse 4, it says, Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others. That's such a good uh, phrase. It is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. How you doing on that? Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. The NIV says, verse 7, this way, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. The New Revised Standard says, it bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, endures all things. And verse 7 in the message says, it puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. I like how the NIV says always, and a lot of times that's kind of a tricky word because you can't, uh, it's kind of a pretty general word, and, and that's pretty challenging. And so uh, always, New Revised says in all things, and that's another interesting phrase. So Paul is, is speaking and one, one commentator said in hyperbole that, that it, you know, he's exaggerating. Well, always and all things are pretty hefty say, sayings. And Paul is speaking of all things acceptable in God's will. And all four things that he mentions here are closely related. And so 
I want to just say that if I'm going to love by looking for the best, there are some things that I can do and things that I choose to do. If I'm going to love by looking for the best, the first thing is this, I will always be protective. I will always be protective. NIV says love always protects. New Revised says it bears all things. This is to protect by covering. Love doesn't run down others by jokes or sarcasm or unkind remarks. Love instead defends the character of the other person as much as possible. Love protects others from exposure, from ridicule, from harm. There, there's a covering there. Some people love to expose people's faults and failures. And I think the Corinthians struggled with that. I think they, they kind of threw each other under the bus a lot. I think they had kind of an every man for himself mindset. And I think the Pharisees did that too. They paid little attention to others except when others were failing or sinning. And love isn't like that. It does not expose or exploit, gloat or condemn. It bears, it protects. That's what love does. I like what it says in Proverbs 10, verse 12. It says, hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers over all wrongs. Love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers over all wrongs. I've heard it said we can measure our love for a person by how quick we are to cover his faults. I'm not saying cover up his faults or her faults. You know, when one of our kids, if you have children, one of our kids does something wrong, we're inclined to put the best face on it possibly that we can possibly do. We would say something like, he didn't understand what he was doing, or, or she didn't really mean that. That's not really her. With a person we do not like, our, our reaction is, is often the opposite. Well, that's typical of them. What else would you expect? See, love doesn't justify sin or compromise with wrong, but love warns and corrects and exhorts and rebukes and disciplines. But love does not expose failures or wrongs. Love, it, love doesn't dot, lie about weaknesses, but neither will it deliberately expose and emphasize them. You see, love protects and love covers. Love reminds me of the mercy seat where the blood of atonement was sprinkled. I think about Rabbi Jack, who was with us a couple weeks ago, talking a little bit about this, that, that it was a covering, not only for the ark itself, but for the sins of the people. The mercy seat was a place of covering. It was at the cross that God gave us a covering over sin by His great love for us, forever covering those who trust in His Son, Jesus. Love wants to buy back, not condemn, to save, not to judge. And that's exactly what Jesus did. And I would say this, that if you've never experienced His covering, this would be a great time. You could just stop the recording right now. You could just stop and you could say, I want to be covered by your blood. You could, you could come into relation with God through the blood of Christ right now. You don't have to wait. Love feels the pain for those it loves and helps carry the burden of that hurt. I'm not talking about enabling someone. I'm, I'm not talking about just throwing money at something or trying to fix someone. I'm not talking about enabling. I'm, I'm not talking about aiding and abetting someone who is doing something wrong or inappropriate. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a true love that's willing to help people in the consequences of their sin. To love them anyway. Peter knew this firsthand from Jesus' great grace and kindness. Peter denied Jesus three times, and he often got some things wrong. He blurted them out. He, he was very impulsive at times, saying things or doing things. But years later, he wrote a letter to people who were going through a really challenging time of persecution and difficulty. And this is what he writes, and I love the tenderness, the maturity, the experience, kind of almost like he's looking back. Here's what he writes, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. That sounds like the Proverbs passage in Proverbs 10 we just read. Love covers over a multitude of sins. 
I've always been kind of fascinated with an eagle. Now, partly is because uh, I went to East High School. We were the East Eagles. That was our, our mascot. But I've always loved eagles. I just, whenever I've been able to see one in the wild, that's just so intriguing and amazing to me. They're a beautiful bird. They're majestic and, and they're powerful. There's some cool things and there's some passages of scripture that that talk about things and, and even the way God loves us and, and compares it to an eagle. It says in Psalm 91 verse 1, verse, verse 1 and verse 4, it says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And verse 4, He shall cover you with His feathers and under His wings you shall take refuge. I love that picture. I love that picture of that's how God covers us as an eagle covers its young with its wings. Well, if I'm going to love for, I'm going to love by looking for the best, first of all, I will always be protective. And secondly, I will never stop believing. I will never stop believing. In the middle of verse 7, it says it always trusts Second phrase that Paul uses in verse 7 is it, all, it believes all things. For some reason, this makes me think of the song by Journey, and this dates me. This is when I was a teenager, um, maybe college age, is Don't Stop Believing. I love that song. Have it on my, on my iTunes playlist. Don't Stop Believing. I love how the NIV says, love always trusts. It believes all things. Now, this does not mean, and please understand, this does not mean that love is gullible or that love is naive or that love is foolish. It's, it's not like you get suckered into everything and believe everything. It does mean that love is not suspicious or doubting of the other person's character or motives without good reason even if their actions have offended you. It's not cynical that if there's a, if there's a problem, it doesn't pile on immediately to blame the other person. It's, it's believing the best in people. Now, if trust has been broken, then, then it needs to be earned again, step by step. It it's, needs to be a, a process that you go through gradually but when you love someone, you, you throw a, a covering over that person and that wrong will be confessed or owned, that there will be repentance and the loved one will be forgiven and maybe even restored. But whenever there's a doubt, we as Christians, we who are going to love like Jesus loved, we want to try to err on the side of grace, that we give grace like God gives grace. That's unmerited favor of God. We, we give this unmerited favor even when it's not deserved. We give it because it was given to us. I like what it says in Psalm 119, verse 66. This is a great, this is a great request. Teach me knowledge and good judgment, for I trust your commands. I think God will do that if, if we really ask him. See, love is a place of trust, and when trust is broken, love's first reaction is to heal and restore. And I just say, don't stop believing. Don't stop believing. Just be glad I'm not singing. Here's the third thing. If I am going to look for the best, if I'm going to love in such a way that I look for the best, the third thing is this, I will always be hopeful. It says in verse 7, third phrase, it always hopes. It hopes all things. Selfless love always hopes. It's not pessimistic. It doesn't expect another to fail but to succeed. Love refuses to take failure as final. Hear me. Your failure doesn't have to be final. It exudes a godly optimism which says, I know you can do it. That God in you is able. Uh, my wife is a doula, so she is a labor and delivery coach. So she'll be with, with uh, moms that are in the process of delivering, and that's hard. And I'm so glad I'm a guy. <laughs> my wife, what she'll do is she'll look them in the eyes and she'll make 
them look at her in the eyes and she'll say, you got this, you got this. I know you can do it. God in you is able. That's what we say when we're hopeful. It doesn't ignore reality. It doesn't close its eyes to problems, but it rests on the promises of God. With, with God, all things are possible is what Scripture says. When everything runs out, it holds on to hope. And as long as God's grace is around, failure is not final. And I, I'm talking to parents of wayward children, children who are far from God, and it's breaking your heart. I'm talking to grandparents who have grandchildren that are far from God and it's tearing you up inside. I'm talking to a spouse of an unbelieving husband or wife. I'm talking about I'm talking to people that have gone through or have a relationship that is struggling and it's challenging. Love never allows hope to die. I like this saying that the rope of love's hope has no end. As long as there is life, love does not lose hope. When our hope come, becomes weak, we know our love has become weak. Well, what do you do in your week? Well, hear this promise from God, from the prophet Isaiah. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. I love Isaiah 40, 31. In fact, I love Isaiah 40. Remember these admonitions and reminders from the Apostle Paul. And I love what Paul says in Romans, especially chapter 5. Romans 5.5, 5, he writes, And hope does not put us to shame. Now another translation, which I really like, says, And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has poured out into our hearts, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, the Holy Spirit helps us with this whole thing called hope. Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, verse 12, that we are to be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. We'll come back to Romans 5 in a little bit. Be joyful in hope. You see, even as circumstances are rough, if situations are hard, if there's a lot of stuff going against you right now, you can still be joyful in the midst of adversity, in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of struggle, you can still be joyful because you have hope. And he helps us to be patient in affliction. And a lot of that all happens because we're faithful in prayer. I read the story of a dog who stayed at an airport at a large city for over five years waiting for his master to return. Now, I'm a dog person. I love dogs. We got a dog named Baxter, and I love Baxter. And before that, we had Sadie, and I loved Sadie. This dog who stayed at this airport at this large city for over five years waiting for the master to return, and employees and others fed the dog and took care of him. He became kind of like the mascot for the airport, but he would never leave the spot where he last saw his master. And he would not give up hope that someday they'd be reunited. Now, if a dog's love for his master can produce that kind of hope, how much longer should our love make hope last? Well, here's the fourth thing. If I'm, if I'm going to be someone who really loves and shows what love looks like. If I'm going to be someone who looks for the best, here's the fourth thing is I will persevere. I will persevere. And IV says it always perseveres, talking about love. And the New Revised Standard Version says it endures all things. Now, the word endure, the word endure is really interesting. It's also uh, persevere depending on which translation translation you use. So the word endure in the New Revised Standard is a military word meaning to sustain the assault of an enemy. To sustain when there's an assault taking place. It's the holding of a vital position at all costs. It endures hardship and suffering, doing all that can be done to hold that position, to stand strong, to stand firm. That's what Paul says is love will persevere, that it always perseveres, and it endures all things. 
Love endures. It, it has the idea of holding up under trial, of persevering in spite of difficulties. It means basically love hangs in there. It doesn't stop. And love finds a way through every circumstance, and love finds a way to persevere. Let's go back to Romans 5. The Apostle Paul said in verses 3 and 4, he said, But we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. So what I think Paul is saying in one of his other letters is that suffering helps us to love better. I... I don't prefer suffering. I, I'd rather not have suffering. If it was on the menu, I wouldn't pick it. But suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character hope. So they're also intertwined what he's saying in verse 7. See, love holds fast to those it loves. It endures all things. It perseveres at all costs. It stands against overwhelming opposition and refuses to stop believing or hoping. Love will not stop loving. That's what I want for us. That's what I want to be. I want to be someone that does not stop loving. I want that for our church that that even if there's challenges or confrontation, even if there's a personality conflict, even if there's differences of opinion, even if there's strong passions for some things, that we still love and our love perseveres no matter what. So let's be brutally honest that sometimes the toughest person to love is the one who may be close to us. The one closest or some of the closest people to us. Sometimes the greatest trials happen within the walls of our home. And sometimes the greatest struggles happen in our families or people we are expected to love. Sometimes it's someone we go to church with or someone we used to go to church with. Remember what James said. James is so practical and convicting and challenging. He writes in James 1 verse 12, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. James says, God blesses the people who patiently endure testing. I like what the writer of Hebrews writes in Hebrews 10 verse 36. He writes, you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what He has promised. You need to persevere so when you have done the will of God, you will receive what He has promised. You see, patient endurance is what you need now so that you can continue to do God's will. And then you will receive what God has for you. Yeah, it's challenging to endure. It's challenging to persevere. But I believe we can do that with God's help. And I can do that if, I think we can do that if we love well. Uh, let me give you four quick takeaways, and then I want to close. The first thing is this. Look for the best and not the worst. Let's, let's be a people. Let's, let's be a, a people. Let's, let's be an organization. Let's be a body of believers that, that look for the best and not the worst. Second thing is this. Don't stop believing. <laughs> and if that song gets in your head, that's okay. Don't stop believing. Don't stop trusting. Third thing is this. Be a distributor of hope. Be a distributor of hope. Be someone that exudes hope. Be someone who lives in hope, where people see joyful hope. And the fourth thing is this what it says at the end of verse 7. Keep going to the end. Keep on keeping on. I, uh, I want us to be people who look for the best. And like I said at the beginning, I think we're going to find what we're really looking for. Let's be people who look for the best. Let's pray. Father, thanks so much for your word that uh, teaches us what love looks like and help us to lean in and to live it. And I thank you so much, Father, for 
the example that you gave us through your love for us by giving Jesus your one and only son. And then when he ascended into heaven, it, it wasn't like we were left hanging, but you sent your spirit to help coach us and mentor us and lead us, convict us and challenge us. I pray God that you would help us to be people that really do love other people and that we are protective and we provide a covering, that we are people who, who uh, just um, don't give up on them and don't lose hope. We don't stop believing and that we would be people who would just keep on. We love you so much. I thank you for every person that's watching this. I pray God you'd speak to their hearts. You'd help us all. We love you and we uh, attribute all of our hope in you. And thank you that you don't disappoint us. We'll give you praise in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Thanks again for watching. I want you to know I'm praying for you and that you are loved. Once again, we welcome you to Woodland Lakes Community Church. And we are glad you are here.